funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee. These days we live in a digital world where nearly everyone is connected and online. Friends and family, even in far-flung corners of the world, are only ever a click away. Global communication is something we take for granted. But of course, this wasn't always the case. And there's a long line of inventors, engineers and innovators we have to thank for our modern communications system. The Wicklow Mariner Captain Robert Halpin was one of these important figures. To find out more, I recently met up with Wicklow town historian John Goodman on location at the Halpin Memorial Obelisk, situated in Wicklow town. We're here at the Halpin Obelisk in the centre of Wicklow town, which was built to commemorate one of our finest sons, Captain Robert Halpin, who was one of the greatest maritime commanders of his day. Uh, He lived from 1836 to 1894, and... He successfully oversaw the laying of thousands of miles of of telegraphic cables beneath the world's seas and oceans, uniting people in Europe, America, Asia and Australia, allowing them to communicate with each other via Morse code, whereas before that they would have had to wait for weeks for letters to arrive by ship. His maritime expertise was one of the main reasons that we were able to build up the global communications network that we have today. He laid the foundations for it. With over 26,000 miles of cable laid all across the world's oceans, he's somebody you should be very proud of. And by laying over 26,000 miles of telegraphic cables in the 1860s and 70s, Halpin helped to usher in the first modern global communications system, with countries able to communicate with each other in a matter of hours instead of weeks or months. Roger Kirker, maritime historian with the National Maritime Museum of Ireland in Dunleary, County Dublin, and also former captain with Irish ferries for 37 years. It was a quantum leap. There's absolutely no comparison before that of how communication could be so improved. Continents were separated by an ocean, and he joined them together so that instead of sailing for weeks, sometimes with bad weather, months on end, he improved so that it didn't matter what the weather was, you could still communicate on the same day. And this was such an improvement for trade, peace, communication was just unbelievably improved and Halpin was crucial to it. In a nutshell, Halpin helped to facilitate a revolution in communications for the Victorian age, just as the internet has revolutionised our own. This is Captain Robert Halpin's story. This was a remarkable man to link the world by submarine telegraph cable. He is one of the forefathers of modern communications. I personally believe that he's a father figure for international communication. What he helped, what he was a part of, laid the foundations for people to be able to communicate across the world. Here's a man from Wicklow Town that linked the world. But the mind blows when you think that this man started something that was an out and out revolution that changed the world. And we're living in it. Before delving further into Halpin's achievements, first it's necessary to investigate his roots. Brian Ellis, maritime historian and also honorary librarian of the National Maritime Museum of Ireland, located in Dunleary, County Dublin. He was born in 1836 in the town of Wicklow. Uh, he was the 13th of the family, <laughs> the last of a family of 13, and his father ran the tavern in the town. and. Wicklow was a very important port. There would have been a lot of coming and going in the town and obviously in the tavern as well. So he would have grown up from a very early age with seamen and with ships and the comings and goings in the harbour. And it would appear to have you know, developed an interest in him. I suppose to a young child it was quite exotic to see all these people coming in with different cargoes and ships going and the weather and the conditions. And at the age of 11 he decided to go to sea. Now, he didn't run away from the family or anything. He applied for an official apprenticeship, which involved basically working as an apprentice on sailing ships for seven years to get his qualification. 
So just how did the 11-year-old Halpin fare as an apprentice in the Merchant Navy? Wicklow historian John Goodman. Maritime trade at that period was a very risky business. Steam was only starting to really come to the fore. They were still relying on sail. Uh, his, one of his first ships to Britain was actually shipwrecked in Bood in Cornwall in 1851. And he was one of the few of the crew that survived, actually swam ashore and uh, carrying the ship's canary. So a very difficult life for a very young man. Like At 1851, he's only 15 years old and he's already survived the shipwreck. He would have been facing death on a daily basis in some cases. Conditions at sea at those times weren't pleasant. It was a very dangerous occupation. And aside from being shipwrecked, Halpin also had to contend with countless other challenges in his new life. Seamus O'Connor, maritime historian and also chairperson of the National Maritime Museum of Ireland. I think the biggest challenge that Halpin remembered when he was sort of talking memories was the loneliness of leaving his home and leaving his mother and leaving his father and his siblings and that took him years to get over that. I mean the normal apprenticeship at that time was just pure hard labour seven days a week whatever the captain said you did it. Now the captain obviously wouldn't put him in a serious position of making serious decisions but he had to learn by watching, by doing, by listening and by being able to receive instructions. In 1852, he joined a barque called the Henry Tanner, and he served as a seaman and mate at that. So at this stage, 1852, he's only 16 years old, and he's already mate aboard a ship. John Goodman. He joined another clipper ship then to Salem, and transferred then to another, the Boomerang, on the Australian and Indian trade runs. So... He's a professional seaman at a very young age and obviously very talented to rise up through those ranks so quickly. Particularly, he doesn't seem to be from one of the landed family, shall we say. It's not like he's got a huge amount of influence that's pushing him through. He seems to be getting his placement through talent and hard work and perseverance as opposed to any other reason. In 1857, at the age of 21, Halpin qualified as a ship's captain. During this period, steamships had begun to gradually replace sailing ships. Looking to the future, Halpin took command of various steam ships. Maritime historian Brian Ellis. He finally settled down with the Galway Line, which was operating steamships to North America. And that was 1858. And he got on well with them, uh, with that particular company, and he was doing well, but on a particular occasion over Newfoundland, the ship ran aground in fog. That ship being a passenger steamship called the Argo. Here's Jim Rees, maritime historian with Arklow Maritime Museum, and also author of the book The Life of Captain Robert Halpin. They were coming up around the southeastern tip of Newfoundland, and they were only hours out of St. John's. But of course, Newfoundland is renowned for its fog, the Grand Banks fogs. Really, you wouldn't see your hand in front of your face in some of these. And amazingly, we would find this laughable now if it hadn't been so tragic. But amazingly, at the time, the wisdom was, and in fact, the captain's instructions were, when you hit a Newfoundland fog and a Grand Banks fog, you went through her at full speed because they believed that the speed of the ship would help disperse the fog. Nonsense as we know it now. And even then, common sense said it was nonsense. But this was the regulations laid down, not only with that company, but even with the likes of Cunard and the major companies. That was the policy. So Halpin, in the fog, he was where are you going at full speed? And as luck would have it, he met a few of the local fishing boats out and he asked them for his position because they couldn't take sightings or anything in the fog and they said no you're on target you just keep going on straight now where you are and there was always the argument that they purposely gave him wrong instructions because within the hour the Argo, the brand new ship was up on rocks and 
an awful lot of the fishing boats and local fishing boats came to help them and take people off. It was almost as if they were pointed into the trouble. Nobody was lost on that. And even most of the cargo was saved. Nevertheless, he was the master. There had to be an Admiralty Court inquiry into it. And within oh, about six, eight months later, he was duly found to be negligent. And his licence was taken off him for nine months. Was he negligent, Jim? His argument was, uh, I mean, from a common sense point of view, and the, and the Court of Admiralty looked at it, you'd have to ask, who goes through fog at full speed? But as I've just said, that was the policy. That was not only his company policy, and they even had at his defence, his defence brought in spokesmen from top lines like Cunard's to say, yes, that, that was their policy too. So he followed policy. But the line was, but he was the captain on board ship. It's his decision there and then. Never mind policy. It's his decision. And he was actually found, I think, because it was only nine months stopping of the licence rather than, say, four or five years or completely to bar them all together, they said, well, look, he was following instructions, but it just happened to be the wrong instructions. But that was really the first downturn in what had been a career that was just building ever you look at the graph and this was a rise 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 and with his master's ticket suspended for nine months and his career in the doldrums Halpin got work wherever he could it was during this period that he controversially became a blockade runner, shipping contraband to Confederate forces during the American Civil War. John Goodman. He ran a couple of ships into the Union blockade to support the Confederacy side. And actually he was, he was captured under heavy fire. He tried to run a blockade. And himself and his crew, only through the influence of the British government, was released, arranged for him. The Union actually had him held prisoner. And would have experienced the Battle of Mobile in Alabama when that sea battle went on to take Mobile Harbour from the Confederacy. So he would have seen quite a lot of heavy life experiences. People would have been dying. His ship was under fire from naval ships. You would probably question his motive in the Civil War era. To me, it was nothing to do with politics. To me, it was to do with earning a living. And maybe because it was contraband he was running, earning a massive living rather than an ordinary living. In 1865, Halpin got a lucky break when he landed the job of first officer on board the Great Eastern Ship, which had been built by the famed engineer Brunel. Now, due to the fact the Great Eastern had failed as a passenger vessel, it was now tasked with one of the most important ventures in modern communications. The laying of a transatlantic telegraphic cable in order to try establish a direct communications link between the old world and the new. Historian Brian Ellis. He was lucky enough to get a job on the Great Eastern, one of the biggest ships of its time. And he got the position of first officer, which basically was the second in command on the Great Eastern. That ship was, as I say, well ahead of its time. It was a massive ship, the biggest ship in the world of the day. The Great Eastern being Brunel's ship, it was the first ship to break 600 feet in length. It had three forms of propulsion, sail, paddle on the boat sides and a screw. John Goodman. Here is Brian Ellis once again. The size of it was five or six times any other ship in the world. Built by Brunel, a huge technical advancement in shipbuilding, double steel hull, massive, massive length. It was the biggest ship of its kind built in the world at that time. She's the big ship of the day and she dwarfed everything else at sea at that time. Roger Kirker. Here is Jim Reese. He became the first officer, not the commander, the first officer in 1864-65. He was in charge of getting the crews ready, make sure everything was right. He had officers under him, but he also had the commander over him. He was also mainly responsible for the navigation and many aspects like that. In many ways, he was the practical, hands-on commander. 
but not in name. He had one guy over him, Commander Anderson. So just how did Halpin's first cabling mission go? Roger Kirker. In 1865, the cable laying commenced from Valencia in Port Mickey. And there was more than the Great Eastern involved. There were several ships accompanying her to assist in transferring cables and various efforts to produce the desired effect. And they set off and they were having problems within with 80 to 100 miles there had been problems of snags interrupting the signal on the cable. And they began to think, actually, this might be sabotage from some competition or from some other effect. And they were put uh, watch uh, guards and sentries on the workmen down the hold who were feeding out the cable that was being laid out on the seabed. But they found nobody at fault. And what was happening was the effect of a, a three, four-inch nail going through the cable and short-circuiting the signal so that they couldn't transmit along it. And when they were testing it the whole time, and the reporters who were travelling with them were reporting back to their papers to say how the progress was going. But once they got a short circuits, they couldn't use the cable anymore. And they had to stop, they had to turn round, and they had to re-haul the cable and cut it and re-splice the cable together. Now, re-splicing a cable at this size is a sizable job. This is kind of joining it again. Once you've cut it, you have to join it again, or what's called splicing. Yes, there are various weaves of wire for strength and for insulation purposes, and also for the core signal carrying. And this had to be wound together in such a way that it was strong enough, or if not stronger, than the continuous wire so that it was a very involved procedure and took several hours to do one splice. And splicing cables wasn't the only issue which the crew had to deal with Seamus O'Connor. Well, I think the biggest challenge for the crew was to put up with the monotonous work that they had to do, possibly. We've never been able to confirm whether... Halpin was a fairly religious man, so we don't know whether they had to work seven days a week or just six days a week. But we feel it probably was seven days a week because of pressure from the company. But you're on a ship that has huge amount of area, a huge amount of stores, huge amount of cable. Everything you do in your working day is a risk. It's a risk of you losing a leg or losing an arm. Mind you, and it did happen, if one of those cables did break and crew were in the way, they were decimated. They were just wiped out, decapitated and lost legs. And if that wasn't bad enough, there was also the Atlantic weather to contend with Porrick or Brolicon, maritime historian and also story editor for the National Maritime Museum of Ireland. The weather factor on the Atlantic is important. What people don't understand, really, and I think, today now because we all fly and um, we don't go and travel on ships anymore on passenger ships there were occasions when if the weather goes bad even a ship as big as the Great Eastern would be tossed around like a cork On one occasion, I remember in my childhood when some of the big ships were crossing the Atlantic that the Queen Mary arrived in New York and had to undergo extensive repairs. Most of the handrails had been broken. Most of the passengers were sick as dogs. The boat was going into 80 foot high waves. Now, even for a ship of the size of the Great Eastern. That is serious trouble. The mountainous siege, and you're trying to keep a ship in parallel with the way you want to go. You're trying to stabilise it 
before the use of stabilizers to keep it that the gear that's playing out the cable is in the right direction to start with and hasn't wrapped around something. But to lay it onto the ground of the ocean at points where there are mountains under the sea and being able to feel, and I think these men had to have a feel for how the cable was being laid and uh, huge, tremendous, tremendous work that they'd done and all under the supervision of, for the most part, Alpen. You've got to remember that laying a cable on the bottom of the Atlantic was a totally new concept. They had laid a few short cables, but this was the big one. This was really the big one. Laying a connection that could be spontaneous between two of the biggest countries in the world. And at that time, communications took from seven to ten weeks now you're thinking about laying a cable. Now, another group had laid a cable a few years before, but the technology was so poor that the cable lasted only a couple of months. On Halpin's trip, the cable was now of a high quality, but on that trip, the cable broke. Porrick O'Brolacon. Here's Seamus O'Connor. But people don't understand, this was experimental. The sea was two miles deep and uh, you couldn't send down a robot camera to see what the hell it was landing on or anything like that. You were paying it out on a very strong machinery, cogs and wheels, and you were experimenting. So when it broke on that 1865 one, it must have been absolutely disastrous. Disaster or not, nevertheless, the crew of the Great Eastern did try to retrieve the lost cable. However, it was no easy task. Jim Reese. By the time they were in mid-Atlantic, and for several, several days, if not a week or two, they were going over three to three and a half miles of ocean underneath the keel of the ship. And that's when somebody was said, there's the old joke, you know, about somebody out in the middle of the Atlantic and say, how far are we from land? And of course, the answer is about three miles straight down. <laughs> so you had this three miles of sea under you. Now, for a cable to break and the support ships would go back over the line you'd taken with their grappling hooks and then crisscross the line until the grappling hook snagged then you pulled it up and hopefully that was the cable pulled up the same as if you were just trying to hook something up out of the bottom of the sink with a little a little pin or something and although Halpin's navigation helped to locate the lost cable, unfortunately they were unable to retrieve it due to the Great Eastern's lifting equipment not being up to the task. Porrick O'Brolicon. On the Atlantic, you've got to understand that these guys had only a window of opportunity of about two months of good weather that they could lay the cables. So it was too late in the year and they had to give up. But Halpin marked where the broken cable laid and now that is important to remember that in sixty-five is a failure we haven't completed the St John's but we know what the problems are we will go back and we'll start again next year we'll work on these problems Maritime historian Jim Reese. So 1866, that's exactly what they did. They worked on the problems they perceived from the previous year. And 1866 cable was carried out in exactly the same way, but it was successful. They got the Newfoundland. Not only that, when they landed the cable in Newfoundland and the link, the first telegraph messages between the Western Hemisphere and London came through, well, first apart from the few in 1858 for a few months, but this was successful. They were so hopeful. I mean, finally, that a message did not take two or three weeks by steamship across the Atlantic to send a message, get one back. It didn't take maybe up to two or three months for a sailing ship there and back. They were able to do this now. It was, you could communicate with Newfoundland, which was already connected to the main United States, the continent of North America. So you were able to send a message from London to New York in an hour and get a message back.
this was the then equivalent of launching an Apollo mission. It was a major operation. Porrick O'Brolacon. Here's maritime historian Patrick Sweeney of the National Maritime Museum of Ireland in Dunleary. In a modern parallel, it would be like the space mission to the moon. Because you were going into the unknown. You were in the middle of a mighty ocean at the mercy of wind and weather. And they were on their own initiative. It was the equivalent of Ireland and Britain sending a man, or sending a rocket even, to the moon in the 1860s. And the world was a better place because of it. Seamus O'Connor. Here is Jim Rees. This is exactly like a hundred years later, in, in 1969, when we watched Men on the Moon. That's the te- scientific communications quantum leap. And Halpin was the senior officer, apart from the commander, on this, the largest ship in the world. He still only 29 at this time. 1866 was only 29. Oz Halpin had taken a reading of where the 1865 telegraphic cable was lost. In 1866, he went all out to retrieve and make it operational. Porrick O'Brolicon. Having got to the other side, slightly on schedule, without too much difficulty, the ship was turned around and moved back and Halpin had marked where the previous cable had broken and with a grapple which is like a large anchor he lifted from slightly more than a mile deep the broken cable from the previous year they took it on board they spliced it and he brought the second cable over to Cape Race where the cable terminated. So, in fact, that year they ended up with two cables for the price of one. So just how significant was Halpin's finding and retrieval of that second cable? Jim Rees. The Times of London reporter put it very well when he said this would be like standing on the top of Nelson's column and with a fishing rod, a fly fishing rod, try and pick something up off the footpath over in Holborn. In London. He was able to go back and find that second piece in an ocean. That's an extraordinary feat of navigation by any standard, and that's even today. James Murphy, Wicklow historian and also operations supervisor with Wicklow Historic Jail. Here's Roger Kirker. Halpin was a very skilled navigator, there's no doubt about it. Halpin was meticulous in his navigation. Halpin, at the time, was one of the greatest navigators in the world. And if the Wicklow man Halpin was praised for getting back the second cable, then he was lauded even more for one particular incident on the 1866 cable-laying mission, which caught the imagination of Victorian society of his day. Jim Rees. At one stage... A block among the rigging, a tackle block in in the rigging had come loose and it was starting to foul in some of the cable and some of the rigging. And Halpin sent a guy up. And this can happen to anyone. It wouldn't matter how often you'd go up, you'd only be one step away from just losing your nerve. No matter how experienced you'd be, you're one step away. And this guy had gone up and untangled this block, this loose block, and he looked down and he was over the main hatch with the engines gone and he could have been 70, 80 feet up at this stage. A certain depth if he was to fall and he just froze. And Halpin saw that. Now Halpin could have commanded any of the three or four hundred crew members to go up and take him down. 
but he didn't. He went up himself. And it wasn't up the rattling. It's not up the ropes that you see the pirates climbing up. He went up this cable with his legs wrapped around and hand over hand until he came right under this crew member. And he just got the crew member's leg round his right shoulder, the other leg round the left shoulder, and he, he brought him down hand over hand. The Times of London was full of this heroic act. Halpin was just a toast of everywhere. That's one of the reasons. In fact, that kind of overshadowed what he had achieved with the cable. So he was a superhero for quite a while. And as was mentioned earlier, the linking of old and new worlds with continuous telegraphic communication from 1866 onwards was a quantum leap in global communications. So how did the general public react? Brian Ellis of the National Maritime Museum of Ireland. Made worldwide news, certainly woke a lot of people up. People who had been a bit sceptical about the communication across the Atlantic. The euphoria was fantastic. There were people out in the streets cheering. It was the World Cup. It was Rocket to the Moon. It was all that. Porik Obrolakon. And promoted to captain of the Great Eastern in 1869 and earning the nickname Mr Cable, Robert Halpin continued to make history by laying thousands of miles of trans-oceanic telegraph cables around the world. Indeed, several countries such as France headhunted him to lay their cable networks. Brian Ellis. The French want to get involved. They want to make connection over to North America as well because obviously Canada was... There was a bare bit going on there between Britain and France over Canada and the Canadians were caught in the middle. But the French said, well, no, you know, if Britain have one over there, we better get a connection over too. So again, that work was done by cable laying ships, Captain Halpin involved. He was hugely respected for what he did. And the fact that it wasn't even a case that other countries looked to lay their own cable. They came to him and asked him to do it, again, using the Great Eastern, using some other steamers that were smaller in in maybe tighter waters and whatever. But it was his expertise they came for. While the ship was a perfect ship for it, it was him that they came to get to lay the cable. John, good man. Here's Porrick O'Brolicon. His expertise was much sought after. He would have been one of the senior players in that particular cable laying game not a pioneer he did not invent the technology he did not do that but he was the man who made it happen and as such as a team leader he would be the equivalent of a top football manager not a top player a top football manager and he was much sought after and much in demand the Portuguese decided, well, they wanted to be linked with Brazil, their main colony over west. Halpin and the Great Eastern was commissioned to do that. Then the British government decided that they wanted to be linked with Australia. And that included going across the Mediterranean land cables in the eastern Mediterranean, down to the Red Sea and the, and the canal. Uh, the Suez Canal had just been completed into the Indian Ocean, across to India, where there was cable already set up on land. That linked to eastern India, and then sailed from east India across to Indonesia and down into Australia. Jim Rees, author of the book The Life of Captain Robert Halpin. The task of connecting Europe with Australia by telegraphic cable was mammoth, and Halpin had to overcome huge challenges to successfully complete the mission. For example... When insulation on the cables began melting on board the Great Eastern as it was working in the Indian Ocean, Halpin cleverly fixed the problem by having the Great Eastern painted white in order to reflect the sun and reduce the temperature inside the ship. We are talking about a man who finished his formal education at 11 years of age, which again shows we should never confuse education with intelligence. Here were all these highly educated boffins trying to sort out a problem. This is an intelligent man whose education after 11 years of age came from hands-on 
practical seamanship and faced with problems that you can't theorise about it all day. You've got to get down and sort it. The He's, plane has to fly, proverbially speaking. Exactly. And this was a guy who, from the time he was 11, was on sailing ships across the Atlantic. Rigging broke, you splice it. Uh, something happens, you couldn't just scrap it and go and buy a new one. You worked. You made do and mend. And uh, if there was a problem, get in, solve it, find a way around it. And the simpler, the better. And the cheaper, the better. And Halpin looked at this. Well, how did, you were talking about putting in sprinkler systems and everything else that would be fed from the sea and in on it. And that could, but that was going to make all the wet inside and you could have drainage and all, but expensive to do. How, just to reduce the temperature. Halpin said, well, if we paint it white, the temperature should be reduced, which is what happened. In our museum, the National Maritime Museum in Dunlera in South County Dublin, we have maps of cables which have been laid. We were very lucky to be presented with a recent map of some of the cables that were being laid all within a few years of one another. Maritime historian Porrick O'Brolicon. It became the flavour of the month. Ships went out, including the Great Eastern, laying cables not only across the Atlantic, but the Pacific to a lesser extent, and also over other parts of the Atlantic, and of course, between islands. And there was a network of cables laid around the civilised world, bringing all the countries up to speed, and they could now know within a day or two of what was happening in their own countries. It was a huge tool, It was also for the great Victorian businessmen and entrepreneurs a wonderful opportunity to advance. If you weren't up to date, as today, if you don't have your high-speed broadband, you're disadvantaged. It was the same in those days with the cables. In a nutshell, the gargantuan cable laying work done by Halpin helped facilitate a revolution in communications for the Victorian age, just as the internet has revolutionised our own. Jim Reese. During his cable laying career of about 10 years, 10 to 15 years, it was a phased retirement, so he can't say he finished on such and such a date. He laid 26,000 miles. Now, that's the circumference of the planet. We are talking in real terms of the first World Wide Web. This was groundbreaking, cutting-edge stuff. He was able to take this cable and connect the new world to the old world and everywhere in between as well. It set up the first World Wide Web. John Goodman. Here's Roger Kirker of the National Maritime Museum of Ireland. On a modern parallel, it was the 19th century equivalent of today's internet or World Wide Web. That's how important it was to the world back then. For half a century, it was the main communication network and the foundations of lots more. It was groundbreaking. It was an immensely important landmark in human communications. It is very hard to figure, if you think about laying 26,000 miles of cable... Porrick or Brolicon. And if you think, I won't do the sums, but if you think how much time that took, and apart from the actual cable laying, which took place at a slow 100 to 150 miles a day at most, sometimes there'd be delays, you just think about the amount of time that man spent at sea And at every moment, the cables were in danger of breaking. You had to make sure the ship was kept in position, in a precise position. You'd got to make sure that it didn't get snagged on any rocks, hidden ravines. The bottom of the sea was invisible to them. They were working literally with their eyes blindfolded. It is quite a massive, exacting 
undertaking requiring a lot of hard, steady, solid work and making sure that everybody was on side. you got to look after your people. You've got to look after everybody on board. And in the whole of his career, he did not lose a life in what was, at that time, probably one of the most dangerous occupations on earth. He certainly studied work practice as well and ensured that they were carried out to the letter. Maritime historian Roger Kirker. Once you're dealing with cables in a heavy stress weather situation and they start parting, they can recoil at rapid speed and if they meet up with flesh, they'll just cut right through you. So the crew were obviously well trained. They knew which side of the cable to stand in case it would part and it, uh, it would be up to Halbert and his officers to ensure that these safe practices were carried out to the letter every single operation because the fact that he didn't lose a man or anyone seriously injured really stood to him. These practices now are commonplace in all working ships, yet accidents still happen because wires are put under extreme stress and when they recoil, they just scythe everything in their path. So it is great credit to help him that this never happened to him or his crews. The fact that he never lost a single crewman, laying over 26,000 miles of cable all over the world, never lost a crewman, never had him injured, that shows that it wasn't just what he did, the manner and how he did things was superb. He was a great man-manager. Certainly nobody was lost. He always advocated health and safety. In the second half of the 1870s, Halpin retired with his family to his beloved Wicklow town, Seamus O'Connor. Captain Halpin comes back to Wicklow, bins Tinnakilly House. What a wonderful house it is. What a wonderful heritage it is for the people of Wicklow. Helps with the fishing industry in Wicklow. Supports by giving good employment. And he was a generous man in the community. He became very active in a lot of local activities. He was a very prominent Freemason, but very altruistic in his way about going through things. So really, like many sailors have said, you know, home is, is, is where the heart is. So with all his wealth and everything he'd achieved, he still came back and, and settled back where he was from. Wicklow Town historian John Goodman. Here's Wicklow historian James Murphy. He becomes a figure of great importance in the town. He's very well respected and he runs for Parliament. Now, he ran against the Parnellites. He didn't want to um, separate Ireland from the Empire. A lot of what he had achieved in his life, he felt, was as an ambassador for Britain, in a sense. Um, So he felt his part was to keep Ireland within that empire and and to keep forging ahead with progress. Um, So that was the reasoning behind him going for Parliament. Unfortunately for himself, he was unsuccessful in that attempt. And Halpin lost that parliamentary election in 1892. Porica Brolacon gives his opinion. He was the kind of man you could respect and the kind of man this country should be proud of. Not a seeker of glory. There was no self-aggrandizement. He did not stand for Parliament because he wanted to. He did it because his people in Wicklow asked him to do so. Now, the fact that he wasn't very good at it is neither here nor there. It actually, in my opinion, shows his honesty. He was a very, very proud Wicklow man. Halpin had a great commitment to the progress of Wicklow. He never forgot his hometown, he never forgot his old friends, and he worked hard to improve their lot as well in County Wicklow. Roger Kirker. Here's Jim Rees once again. He always advocated the development of fisheries and sea trade, maritime trade for County Wicklow. Regardless of what his politics or anything else was, he was a proud Wicklow man at heart. In late 
1893. Robert Halpin cut his toe. Due to the fact he had diabetes and the modern medicines which we have nowadays weren't available back then. Gangrene set in and he died shortly afterwards. Roger Kirker. It was tragic, all right, that he died an early death, less than 60 years of age, after such an exciting and dramatic life abroad, all sorts of dangers that he came across. And to be snipping his toenails one day, he carelessly cut skin and gangrene set in to his toes and worked up and he died a painful death following in January 1894 so that uh, it was a, a sad untimely end for such a Wicklow man. So what type of funeral did Halpin get? Jim Rees. Massive, massive funeral. The 1890s, early 1890s, mid-1890s in Ireland was divided right down the middle. But when it came to somebody like Halpin, political differences were pushed to one side. This was a remarkable man who had his own political beliefs that I personally wouldn't subscribe to and a lot of people wouldn't, but that was his beliefs. But he never allowed those to interfere with what he felt was right. On the ship's list, the Great Eastern crew list, you will see many, many Arklow and Wicklow men listed, irrespective of religion or political stance whatsoever. To him, that wasn't important. Uh, It's just he personally believed in the union of Britain and Ireland. He was never, ever bitter in condemning Parnell or anything about home rule because he believed Parnell only wanted the good for the county and the country as well. He just in a different way. So he was very good like that and every aspect. If you go back to uh, accounts of his funeral in the Wicklow newsletter, in the Wicklow people, wonderful, wonderful. Thousands of uh, people turned out. There were even some photographs. and uh, Just wonderful. And he is buried in the Protestant graveyard there in Church Street. And it's a Celtic cross overlooking Wicklow Town and looking out to sea at the same time, the two things he loved best. Captain Robert Halpin was a remarkable Irish mariner who showed courage, initiative and enterprise throughout his eventful life. So what is his ultimate legacy? Jim Rees. His legacy was being in there really among the pioneers of international, global communication. We're talking about when those cables were laid. We are talking in real terms of the first World Wide Web. If you think about it, all these cables going in. And I don't want it to sound like he was the only one there. Without Robert Halpin, this wouldn't have happened. Without Robert Halpin, it wouldn't have happened as efficiently as it did. It would not have happened as safely as it did. He just broke so much ground. His ultimate legacy has to be the quantum leap of the art of communications. Seamus O'Connor, here's Roger Kirker. Well, you didn't have to wait two or three weeks to fulfil your orders. It was unimaginable, the effect that this would have on trade. Everything that we have today is built on the work that Halpin would have done in his time. John Goodman. And again, in a very short period of time, to lay 26,000 miles of cable, we keep going back to that. It's an incredible, incredible feat of seamanship. The improvement of communications because of Halpin's contribution would be akin to the development of the internet in today's modern age. What a communications gift to the world. For the most part, the laying of it certainly, masterminded by Captain Halpin.
funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee.